Today I want to speak to you about going deeper in prayer. Turn to your neighbor and say, go deeper. Turn to your other neighbor that was not your first choice and say, in prayer. I reserve that word for you, in prayer. Amen. If you have your Bible, let's go together with me. We're going to open Luke chapter 5 and verse 5. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. The prayer challenge that we have as a church, in the beginning of the year, we have a fasting challenge for 21 days where we take time to fast and pray. But in the middle of the year, we are taking a prayer challenge where we are taking time to pray, to intercede, to fast, to realign ourselves with God's purposes and call for the rest of the year. It is possible to get halfway through the year and get discouraged, get disappointed. It happened with Nehemiah. When the wall was built halfway, the Bible says the people got discouraged. The enemy started to plot conspiracies. But then they prayed and got help to turn the plots of the enemy into nothing. They were able to finish the wall. And I speak prophetically that things that God started in your life, He will bring to completion in your life. If you seek His face, if you pray, and if you realize that maybe you drifted, but it's time to draw back to God draw near to God, be recalibrated for the purpose of God. If you feel foggy, confused, if you feel a bit kind of like distracted, if you feel a bit defeated, if you feel disappointed, if you feel like a little bit lost, it's not how you started this year. Like man, I'm just waiting till January. No, no, no. You don't need to wait till January. The Lord has a word for you right now and that is August has come. It's the middle of the year and it's time to recalibrate. It's time to renew. It's time to recommit. It's time to reset. It's time to get back it's time to rise again it's time to shake off the disappointment it's time to seek the Lord's face again it's time listen you don't have to be motivated you can choose to do that and if you've been waiting for the sign I am your sign it is time to see God come on somebody I'm gonna share with you just five thoughts from this miracle catch somebody shout miracle catch that's exactly what God wants your life to have this year, a miracle catch. That's exactly what God wants your ministry to have this year, your life group is a miracle catch. It's exactly what the Lord wants your finances and your health to have, a miracle catch. But the first thing I want to highlight and where the story starts and that is, as I'm going to call it, life without Jesus. Because a life without Jesus is a life, I'll summarize in this statement, we toiled all night and caught nothing. Jesus was not in a boat. Jesus was not a part of their life. They were fishermen and they were fishing all night and they caught nothing. But the Bible doesn't say they fished all night. It says they toiled all night. Because life without Jesus is a life of striving. It's a life of toil. It's a life of burden. It's a life of sin and it's a life of catching nothing. You're always chasing and never able to catch it. You, your heart has a God-sized hole that no sex, no clubs, no drugs could ever fill. No boyfriend, no new car, no bachelor's degree, master's degree, a promotion can fill. Because if it will fill it, you would need to drink yourself to sleep. If it will fill it, you would need to club. If it would fill it, you would need weed if it would feel it you would need you would not need to get high but because something is there what is there there is no most high in the heart and that's why there is a craving there is a longing but the Bible describes the state of a person who is without Jesus like this spiritually dead Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 separate from God Ephesians chapter 4 verse 18 under the wrath of God John chapter 3 verse 36 living in darkness John chapter 8 verse 12 slave to sin John chapter 8 verse 34 condemned John chapter 3 verse 18 blinded by the God of this age 2 Corinthians 4 4 without hope and God Ephesians 2 12 some are looking at this list like what that, that is my resume that's who, how did the Bible do what this is 2,000 years ago that is my life that's exactly how life is without God See, when God created us, before He made us, the Bible says He spoke to the ground and said, ground, produce 
plants and the plants came from the ground and that's why plants need the ground to live then God spoke to the water and said water produce fish and every moving thing in the water and because fish came from the water fish need the water to live and then God spoke to himself and said let us make man in our image and likeness so man came from God we are made in the image of God and therefore we need God as fish needs water and plants need soil when you lose God when you leave God what begins to happen is you spiritually die. When sin gets between you and God, it doesn't matter how educated you are, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter how good looking you are, and honestly, it doesn't matter what religion you are, you are dead. You can be a beautiful goldfish, without water you're dead. You can be the most beautiful tree, without soil you're dead. You still look like a tree except dry and dead. As a Christian, we must understand first where we came from. I'm describing here not a life of a Christian, I'm describing a life BC, before Christ. But some of you in here, you came in today and I'm describing your current state. When Adam sinned against God, the first thing Adam did is he hid from God. Humanity still does that. We hide from God. That, why we don't want to pray? Why we don't want to spend time with God is because there's a sin in our life and this sin not only separates us from God but this sin causes us to feel ashamed and guilty and this sin causes us to create a religion our way of approaching and pleasing God. Adam quickly covered with fig leaves his nakedness thinking well this will cover naked cover my shame but you have to understand no amount of good works no religion in this world could ever solve a sin problem because sin problem can only be solved by a savior. See God gives us the law to remind us we are sinners. It's like a thermometer. You know, you, you put the thermometer so that you can measure the temperature of your body. You know, if you have a fever or not. How many of you know that swallowing it doesn't cure the fever? Good works, the law, your conscience is there to tell you you're bad. And you, you will have new age, you will have the witchcraft, you will have the cultural religions that they will tell you, no, you are good. No, you're not. You're not good, you're dead. We caught nothing, the Bible says. So don't believe the lies of the culture. When you're separated from God, you are dead. You are defeated. And there is, listen, it doesn't matter how much perfume you spray on a corpse, it's still a corpse. So sprinkle a little bit of good works and well, you know, I went to church, I feel so much better. You're still a corpse. Yes, you must say, man, I, I came to kind of get, get encouraged today. Well, you're dead and you need resurrection, not encouragement. And that resurrection only comes from one person. It's not Buddha. It's not Krishna. It's not Muhammad. That's why them, they don't criticize and mock at Olympic Games because they're dead. They know they're dead. You only mock somebody that's living and somebody that's a threat. There is no other name given under heaven by which we can be saved by the name of Jesus. It is Jesus that saved. Oh come on somebody. It is Jesus that forgives our sins. Why? Because it is Jesus who died for us. If somebody loves Jesus who changed your life from death to life, give the Lord a praise in this house this morning. Life without Jesus. Life without Jesus is empty life. Maybe you're here today and you find yourself with your nets being empty. They're empty of peace. They're empty of joy. They're empty of fulfillment. They're empty of purpose. Instead, they're filled with depression. They're filled with heartbreak. They're filled with abortion, gender confusion. Maybe they're filled today with anxiety. You came to the right place because we're here today not only to point to the fact that we toiled all night and caught nothing, but I gotta read you another verse. And this verse is verse 3. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. The second thing we see is Jesus gets inside of the boat. See, life without Jesus is empty. But it's not only empty on this earth. Life without Jesus is separated from God. Life without Jesus is spending eternity in the lake of fire and spending hell on earth as well. Life in Jesus 
is when I want you to notice the difference we toiled all night and the next reference we see is Jesus sat in the boat life in Jesus is a life of rest life of grace life of acceptance it's a life where you are the new creation it's a life where you are redeemed it's a life where you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit it's a life where you are cleansed by God life in Jesus is a new life can somebody say amen it's where you are seated in the heavenly places you're part of the body of Christ you're a citizen of heaven you become victorious it's when you are justified it's when you are cleansed life in Jesus the Bible says and he taught the multitudes because when you become a Christian Jesus comes to live inside of you before you start to even do things for God you must learn who you are in God otherwise you will fall back into legalism trying to earn God's love you will always feel like you don't measure up it's never enough never enough of reading of the Bible never enough of prayer never enough of witnessing it's never enough it's like you're trying to please a boss who is very demanding a perfectionist but the challenge that we have to understand today is that Jesus presented us not our boss who's in heaven but our father who's in heaven there's about 15 13 to 15 references of God the Father in the Old Testament to God the Father there's 100 references just in the Gospel of John the New Testament tells us this when you become a Christian Jesus comes to live inside of you but something happens in the spirit realm you become a child of God if you don't understand this revelation prayer will be a chore prayer will be a discipline prayer will be like ah like going to a dentist I need to I wish I don't have to it's like pulling wisdom teeth prayer will be like cleaning your yard you're like yeah I have to pull those weeds prayer becomes a burden and if you do it you hate it and if you do it you hate everybody else who's not doing it why because you don't enjoy God you don't love him you don't know he loves you you really think that if you don't pray enough if you don't fast enough he might not love you he might kick you out of his uh, your, your life and you don't understand that a Christian life is being seated in Jesus I don't pray so God can love me I pray because he loves me I don't fast so God can accept me I'm accepted and therefore I fast I don't do what I do for the Lord preaching, traveling and pastoring the church because I'm afraid of going to hell. I do it because I love God and I love God because He so loved the world. You know, uh, my love, could you, could you bring me my illustration, my living example? I want to show you guys an example just for a moment and I hope that this will communicate uh, this more uh, closely and more realistically. Today is a lot of illustrations. They will draw the point. Could you, could you come this way? Let's give a round of applause to the sun. This is my boy. He still hasn't called me Papa yet. He doesn't know how to crawl. He doesn't know how to speak. He has not washed the dishes yet. He hasn't cleaned the house yet. Honestly, he has cost me a lot of money, a lot of time, and sleep as well. I wanted him before I met him. I chose him before he even opened his eyes. I longed for him before he even came on this earth. His position in my heart, he's never worked for this position, never qualified for this position. And this position is he is a son. It's been given to him because of his birth, not because of his efforts. He will always stay my son when he learns to walk, speak, clean, go to school. His condition will always change. His position remains the same. 
See you have to understand in order to passionately pursue God you must understand is that your position in God's heart will always be the same. You are God's child. He says you didn't choose me I chose you. The Bible says we love God because He first loved us. You'll never be able to outlove God. You're not the beginner of the love of God. He is the initiator. You're just the responder. And you know this boy, this, this morning, you know, my wife, uh, she um, finished her duties at five. I picked up mine at five. And so I laid with him for just for a little bit. And he's kicking my face every five seconds. <laughs> you know. He's crying every five minutes. He's not looking for me. I'm always looking for him. I always comfort him when he cries. I don't beat him. When he falls asleep in my arm, I say, wake up. How dare you fall asleep in my presence? If he falls asleep, gives me joy. Why? Because he's my son. I love him. And because I love him, in my family, he is growing and because he's growing he's changing that's why one of our mottos at hungry gen is we don't change by trying we change by growing you see one of our statements says growing people change you cannot change if you're trying to change you can change if you're trying to grow but you cannot grow if you don't have an environment where you are fully unconditionally accepted and that environment is not religion that environment is the hands of a heavenly father who says i chosen you i love you and I will comfort you. As a father pities his children, I will pity you. What kind of a love God has bestowed upon us that he called us his children. That's why you don't go to prayer to prove to God that you're a Christian. You go to, to prayer to enjoy God's love. You don't go to prayer to find God. God's never been lost. You go to prayer to be with God. That's why you're not treating prayer as something, oh it's a chore. It's a joy because I get to spend time with my father. That's why Jesus says when you go into prayer, he says speak to your father who is in secret. Your father is already there in prayer. Speak to him like in secret. Sometimes you don't, have, you don't know what to say. It's fine. Be there. He still doesn't know what to say. He spends time with me every single day. Just kind of does what, what he's doing right now. I enjoy his company. And God enjoys yours. He loves you. If you don't get that revelation, you will never enjoy prayer. Prayer will always be an uphill battle, pushing a semi-truck up the hill. Prayer will always be like lifting weights or something very burdensome. Let Jesus sit. Let the presence of God rest in your life. We don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. We don't do right things to be righteous. We are righteous so we can do right things. By grace we've been saved, not of good works, let, lest any man should boast. We got to come back to the place because we cannot be passionate for God if we don't know He died, loves us and nothing we can do to make Him love us more. He's done nothing to deserve that love. I don't love Him because He's cute. I love Him because He's my son. He is cute though. <laughs> Write this down. Intimacy with God flows from identity in Christ. If you don't know your identity, you will never have intimacy for a life. Intimacy with God flows from identity in Christ. My position is permanent. My condition changes. My condition improves but my position doesn't improve. Because I preached last weekend in London in Kansas and saw people saved, God doesn't see me as an upgraded son. I'm not son the junior. I am God's child. Before I'm a pastor, I'm a son. Before I'm a husband, I'm a son. Before I am an author, 
I'm a son. That position is the most important position I occupy because you can take everything else from my life. You cannot take that from my life because it was secured by the blood of Jesus. And my second birth, the new birth that God performed by His grace, giving me a brand new heart and brand new life. Jesus said, the Bible says, and He taught them the truth. He taught them the Word of God. Until you get to that place where you toil you cut nothing, you toiled. The second place is, and that's why many of you are afraid of being Christians because you're like, well, if I become a Christian, I just have to work very hard for a God that's perfect. It's very different. Christian life isn't about working hard first. Jesus says, abide in me. And then in John chapter 15, he says, abide in me, let my words abide in you. And then he says this, and then ask the Father. See, if your prayer doesn't flow from abiding, it will always feel like a chore. It will always feel like, oh, oh, prayer, 21 days of prayer. Are you kidding me? 21 days of fasting. Man, it's just another reminder that I haven't been praying. Man, the church just always brings that guilt in my life. See, you're missing the whole point. Your identity in Jesus makes your intimacy possible. Your identity in Jesus, Jesus making you a new creation, a child of God, a bride of Jesus, a friend of God, makes that intimacy possible possible. Amen. It sets us free. God loves us and because He loves us, we respond loving Him back. If your focus is how much you love God, you're gonna, you're gonna be very self-righteous, legalistic and condemning of anybody who doesn't measure up to your standards and you will be extremely hard on yourself and you will have roller coasters. There will be good days, you will be so good and usually you will have more bad days than good days. On the bad days you'll be so depressed, you'll be doubting even if you're saved. Why? Because you're the focus. Think of yourself as a moon. Moon is just a dark ball. The only light the moon gives is the light moon reflects. You don't have light inside of you per se. You have light of Jesus and if you focus on His light, you will always shine. If you focus on His love, you will always love Him back. And when you focus on your love for Him, your love will decrease. Your love will go like this and like that. Your love will be legalistic. Your love will be passionate but aggressive, mean, zeal, hurting other people. But you're on fire for God, but you're also a jerk for Jesus. Kind of like, like all over the place. You will lack compassion. You will lack kindness. You will lack, and honestly, and half of the days you will be either excited or the other days depressed because you're not stable. Guess who's stable? He is. His fire is the only one that never burns out. That's what caught Moses' attention when he came to the burning bush. You know what caught his attention wasn't the fire in the bush, it's that the fire didn't burn out. My fire burns out. I have bad days. I have Mondays and, and you know and Fridays happiness increases. Mondays it, it crashes. And so that, that is me. I'm a human being. But if I focus on me, that's going to be a bad thing. Jesus didn't give me salvation to put me on a treadmill of performance. Salvation isn't a treadmill. Salvation is a crib. And He says, you're the baby. I'm the father. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to grow you. I'm going to help you. And I'm going to mature you through my grace. You were saved by grace and you're going to be sustained by my grace. My son has no chance of ever becoming an adult without unconditional love and care of his parents every day. The rest of I don't know how many years 10, 15, 25, 35. Okay at least 10 years. It's not only the birth that he needed his parents, it's his growth. And many of us think Jesus died for me on the cross. He took care of my sins. From now on it's like he passed on the book of the commandments. He says now learn to walk, learn to burp, <laughs> learn to clean yourself up uh, and, and just really learn to run and do all of this stuff. Good luck and I'm gonna be on the other side hoping you finish and I will cheer you on. That is not Christianity. Christianity isn't try harder. Christianity is I finished it on the cross. What is Jesus' word says? It is finished. And then Jesus says, lo I am with you always. And He's not on the outside yelling to us try harder. He's on the inside propelling us giving us the desire, giving us the grace. So when you look from that position, prayer becomes a delight. 
Prayer becomes a something you want to do because God isn't mad at you. He loves you. He wants to be with you. And why wouldn't you want to be with Him? Amen. Jesus, the Bible says, He sat in the boat of Peter. But I want us to go to one more step further. And that is this. When He said, finished teaching, the scripture says, so we, we talked about life without Jesus, life in Jesus, and let's address what now life with Jesus. Luke chapter 5 verse 4, then he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. I love this because you know in, in here when Jesus was in the boat he was just a little bit away from the shore and as he was teaching and this is a very important place we all need to start always be in this place but from this place we go forward and what is this place nothing I can do can make God love me more or less now some people are freaked out by their thought because they're like well Vlad you're giving everybody a license to sin first of all I've not met one person who needed a license to sin <laughs> sinning is not something you're like yeah let me go get a license for this okay so we, we don't need a license to sin grace isn't a license to sin knowing God loves you isn't a license to sin it's power to overcome sin it's power to live holy life that power is only in Jesus and his grace Jesus sits there he finishes speaking and he tells Peter he says now I want you to launch into the deep and let down your nets for a catch see Christian salvation always leads to what we called sanctification now for some of you who maybe not understand what the word sanctification is let me bring it to you in the baby terms it's when a baby grows. So my son, he was born eight pounds. Today, that boy is 17 pounds. Four and a half months. How did he go from eight to 17? It's called growth. Now, did I put him into a school? Did he take classes on growth? No. Love, a lot of sleeping, a lot of milk. A lot of milk. And then naturally, he grows. Within a year, he's going to grow more. You should not have never stay where you started. Because Christian life is unconditional love from God. But it's also continuous growth in God. A Christian that says, well, God loves me. And he stays the same way for the last 20 years. If my boy would have been the same way four months later, the same weight, the same appearance, everything four months later, we would be taking him to a specialist and saying, we need to check him. Something is not right. We would say, this is not healthy. He's alive, but not healthy. God wants Christians to be healthy. And to be healthy means to be growing. Now, what does this growth look like? I'm so glad that you asked. Jesus tells, Jesus tells Peter, he says, lunch out into the deep. So going into the deep. Now the word deep for many people, spiritually speaking, sometimes it means to be like, man, this person is deep. And when a Christian says that, especially in the charismatic circles, means whatever they said, I have no idea. It's very mysterious. They talked about like this mysterious thing that I'm like, like sounds so cool. I really want to learn that. I have no idea how that applies to my personal life and I don't know if it works in their life but I mean it sounds so so cool tell me more about the deep things I'm not talking about that depth I'm not talking about that what does it mean to be deep what does it mean to be sanctified in 2nd Timothy chapter 2 verse 20 Paul says in God's house that are not only vessels of gold and silver but there's also wood and clay he says some for honor some for dishonor I'm paraphrasing him in the next verse he said verse 21 he says this he says that if we are sanctified and that we are cleansed we will be vessels for honor useful for the master prepared for every good work you're like okay great that's really what it means to be deep and then in the verse 22 he breaks it down in three simple steps are you ready for this he says this flee youthful lust pursue purity, pursue righteousness, pursue love, so meaning pursue good things and then there's one more phrase there, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So to go deep has three components. Somebody say flee, somebody say pursue and somebody say with those. So 
to be spiritually deep meaning I'm running from something I'm running after someone and I'm running with some people let me say that again to the people in the second sanctuary and on YouTube I am running after someone his name is Jesus as I'm running after Jesus I'm running after purity I'm running after righteousness I'm running after honesty I'm running after after kindness I am running after fidelity I am running about after integrity so I'm not running after these qualities I'm running after Jesus and he helps me to reach these qualities as I am running after purity at the same time I am fleeing lust see you can't be pursuing flirting with lust and you are not running after Jesus you got to run after Jesus and you at the same time flee this where the problem happens with growth is this is where many people think it happens in a vacuum you cannot grow in a vacuum you cannot go deep in a vacuum with those who call on the Lord's name where many of us experience stagnation in our growth is this we get fired up on Sunday or we get fired up by watching a video reading a book we get fired up by a conviction of the Holy Ghost and we're like that's it I'm running after God but the problem is your five best friends are slowing you down. Saying no to drugs, the goal isn't to just to say no to drugs, it's to say yes to something greater than drugs that gives you power to say no to drugs. If all you're doing is looking at that weed and say, oh I just, I'm just saying no to weed, you will go back into it because you never, you never said yes to anything greater. Say yes to God then you'll be empowered to say no to sin but when you do that I'm gonna ask you a question who are you running with because that last portion can trip up the whole thing it can mess the whole thing up and most of us were like man I love this idea of running after God I'm gonna say no to sin but man I don't need people around me man I got burned by people I had life group experience before I went to this church I went to that listen just because something happened there just because a barista messed up your coffee don't give up on coffee that easy <laughs> okay that's a bad illustration just because you had a bad church experience it does not mean that you throw away biblical principle by which God said you are to grow you and I need each other so that we can run with each other amen so life without Jesus toiling and empty life in Jesus is a life of grace it's a life of rest it's a life of peace it's not a life on a treadmill where we're trying to constantly please this God who's never pleased always raises the bar no it's a life where you starting from a point you are loved you're accepted you're pleased but he loves you so much he wants you to grow he doesn't stretch you I don't stretch my son every day <laughs> That's not how we grow. Most of you think that's how God's gonna grow you. Come in every time and like, stretch you, stretch you. Does God stretch our faith? Yes, but God always grows us spiritually by milk of the word. And how did we go deeper? By running after Him, running away from things the Holy Spirit highlights, and then running with people God puts in our path. Whose text message have you not been responding to when they invited you to a life group? respond to them after the service and say prodigal has come home when is the next life group whose person that you know can spiritually inspire you that you've been avoiding and let's go a step further who is someone who honestly has been tripping you up spiritually maybe it's time I'm not saying we're not talking about that you you blocked them we're saying Maybe put them aside for a moment and say, hey, I need to find me some good friends. I need to find me some godly friends. Especially those of you in school. Younger people. This is crucial. Your friends can make you or break you. They're like elevator. They will take you up or they will take you down. Your friends are going to either bring you closer to Jesus or pull you further from Jesus. I want you to notice the fourth thing that happened here is this. Luke chapter 5 verse 6. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So life without Jesus is empty. Life in Jesus is full of God's grace. 
Life with Jesus is growing in Jesus by running from sin, running after Him and running with God's people. When you do that, I want you to notice what happens. The Bible says is their nets, now they didn't have nets like these, it was more like the ones that you probably have seen in the TV series where those nets were being filled with fish. The scripture says, and they caught a lot of fish. In fact, this is called a miracle catch. I want to speak into somebody's life today. The Lord wants to bring a miracle into your net. He wants to bring a miracle in your family. He wants to bring a miracle in your finances. He wants to bring a miracle in your health. Those empty nets that you've had before. Maybe you came to Christ with broken finances. Maybe you came to Christ with broken marriage. Today the Lord wants you to have a miracle catch in your family in your marriage. A catch that will surprise your friends. A catch that will attract other people to say, man, look what God is doing in Austin's life group. I want to go to his group. Why? Because there is a catch that is happening there. Look what God is doing in Julian's life. I want to get around that because there is a catch that is happening there. There is a miracle. There is a blessing that is happening in their life. And others will seek to even connect to you so that they can collect with what God is doing through your life. He wants to do a catch. He wants to do a blessing. He wants to do a breakthrough in your life. We serve a good God. Can somebody say amen? We serve a God who came to give life and more abundantly. He wants to fill your heart with joy. He wants to fill your marriage that becomes a light to the rest of the family. He wants to bless you with good health and good principles so that you can live long and serve Him. Amen. But one thing I do want to highlight if you want to have a catch, you have to have a net. If you don't have a net, it's not that God will not put fish. It's that they'll never be in your boat. What is a net? A net speaks of, see when God created us, He always puts something in us, even if it's small, that He wants us to use to advance His agenda. For example, God made Adam. He made Eve out of Adam. How did Adam's kids were made? Because something is in Eve and something is in Adam that got together and became a baby. How do new trees get planted? God doesn't send us the seeds. The seeds are in the current trees that we extract and put them in the ground. That means God will bring a miracle using your net. God will bring a blessing using what you have that you and I many times despise. That's why when God came to Moses and said, you know, I'm about to deliver people. And he says, what is in your hand? And Moses says, well, I just got a rod. It's nothing. God's like, that's enough. Throw it on the ground. A woman had a lot of dead and the prophet came and says, what do you have in your house? She says, I don't have anything. Just a little bit of oil. It's a little bit of flour. Well, that's enough. If you put it down and you put it into God's hand, God will use it. Commit your ways to God and He will establish your paths. That's why when Jesus wanted to feed the multitudes, He didn't bring manna from heaven. He said, what do you guys have? They said, well, we just have very little. One boy brought a lunch. His mom was very generous and, and gave him five loaves and two fish. Jesus says, that's enough. See, what you have is not enough for you. What you have is not enough for you. What you, you don't have what it takes for you, but you have what God takes and He'll make it to work through you. When you give God a net, God will fill it with fish. When my pastor started this church, there were just few families. He believed for revival and he went and found a building. It was this building. People made fun of him and they said, who will come? We had enough people to fill first two pews. But see, it was an empty net. God doesn't fill if you don't give him a net. And I remember when we got this net, it was this building. We didn't have money to pay for this building at first. But see, if God is with you, he will sustain you. And God brought us a government school that really paid our bills for the first 10 years of our existence as a church here. And then one by one on the youth services people start coming. And now this net is not big enough. We have to ask our friends in Kennewick to borrow us a different net. Because see, many of us will say, God I want a miracle. But God says, I need a net. God blesses the work of our hands. God doesn't bless your wishes and your fantasies. 
Dreams are good, but give God something to bless. Give God something to touch. Give God something to breathe on. The Lord wants to cooperate with you. He wants to partner with you. God doesn't want to give you a fish. He wants to put fish into your net and He wants you to catch it. God is not a socialist. God believes in partnering with you and I for us to be involved in His creation and exercise dominion. Amen. If I want to touch the world, I got to release videos. I got to try. I got to preach. I can't just sit there at home and say, well God, you just do a miracles. No, I got to open it. I got to give God a net. Which net do you need to give the Lord? Has your home, do you know that your home can be a net to catch souls? Did you know that your car can be a net by which you can bring people to Christ? Did you know that your marriage can be a net that can uh, draw other couples to Jesus? Did you know that your job can be a net? Did you know that if you stretch it to God and say, Lord, I'm going to give it to you, lower it down, meaning God, I submit it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. God can feel it and God can do a miracle in your family. Amen. Let's finish this message with the last thing. So the miracle catch happens here. The net is filled with fish. Now you will think Peter is about to start Miracle Catch Ministries International LLC. Jesus, let's do it again. Jesus, what is the formula? Let's create e-courses and write a book on how to have a miracle cash. Jesus, let's start a YouTube channel and tell everybody else how to have a six-figure income with partnering with Jesus. That's not what happens. That's not how this story ends. How this story ends is Luke chapter 5 verse 11, when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed Him. Whoa. Never leave Jesus for fish. But sometimes you'll have to leave the fish for Jesus. Many of us celebrate in the club what we prayed for in the church. We celebrate with liquor what we fought for with tears. Real breakthrough is the one that brings you closer to Jesus, not further from Him. Your miracle is not the point. It's a means to an end and the end is the purpose of God. You may say, but Jesus did a miracle for them. Not really. The miracle here was just an invitation not to improve their fishing company but actually to pull them out from that into something greater and something better. I found out this, they said a study, it was done, that if you make $85,000 a year, anything above that doesn't improve your happiness. So if your happiness that you get at $85,000 a year, it stays, that level of happiness never increases if you get more. There is a cap in your fulfillment and joy when the Lord starts to bless your nets. The only way to go deeper, further, more fulfilled is not to get more fish. Sometimes it's to leave the fish and to follow the purpose of the one who walks on water. And what is that purpose? For each one of us that purpose is different. When I think of my friend, Pastor Ilya, who is a pastor at Hungry Gen. He's been here for 20 years. We served together. He helped with so many things at this church and businesses. And you know, he has three beautiful daughters and everything was so comfortable here. And finally, we got to a point where two areas he was responsible for at Hungry Gen for as long as I could remember, got taken care of. And I was thinking, man, perfect. Pastor Ilya is just gonna go, you know, on a relaxing. And he goes into more fasting and the Holy Spirit says, it's time to forsake the miracle catch. Because this is a miracle catch for him. What we see here today is a miracle catch. It's God moving. It's time to leave that behind and go into the unknown territory and to pursue the will of God. And the will of God is to win souls and make disciples. And for him, and that is to go in Seattle area. I remember the first time I heard it and I said, bro, what sin did you commit? Why, why is the Lord punishing you like that? Why is He dealing with you like that? But see, that's how the Lord deals with us, is that He uses the blessing as a springboard for His purpose. 
At the end of your life, what will matter is not how many fish you caught, is could you hear him say, faithful and good servant. That's why our prosperity has a purpose and that purpose is the kingdom of God. That's why our marriage is not the mission, our marriage is on the mission. So many people get married and they make their marriage a belly button of their whole life. No, your marriage has a mission and that mission is the purpose of God. That's why our homes, our cars, our finances, our bodies, they all have a purpose and that purpose is to fulfill the will of God. And we know the will of God is to win souls and to make disciples. Some of you sitting here today and you're leading a life group right now. But what you don't know, the breakthrough God is going to be bringing to your life group that will multiply into many life groups one day. You will be at the place where Peter was at, where you will leave the breakthrough of what you knew so that you can follow Jesus and shake the nations and shake cities for the kingdom of God. There is others of you, you're standing today, you just lost your job, you're about to go into a business. God is about to bless your business. But what you think is God is blessing your business for you, but you don't know is that God is going to be using you as a kingdom financier. So that when we get a corner lot or we get built an orphanage, we don't have to do a fundraising. All we got to do is you just talk to God and God just talks to you. God will use us for His glory. Can somebody say Amen. You know, I heard this story, and I mentioned it before in our church. There was a retired Soviet Armenian champion swimmer. His name is Shavarsh Karapetyan. He's 11 time world record holder, 17 time world champion, 13 time European champion, and 7 time USSR champion. On September 16, 1976, on his usual 12 mile run with his brother Kamo, a trolley bus was carrying 92 people that fell into the side of freezing water. That bus was about 80 feet offshore and 33 feet deep. So, and this is the picture from that incident. What happened with Shavar? So, he wins championships around the world. He's Olympia, Olympic uh, ch championship world record in swimming. Running 12 miles. Sees a bus sliding off the road into this freezing lake. One option is, you know, we'll do what maybe a lot of people will do. Let me just call the emergency services. Let me stretch my hands and pray about them. Because, you know, I don't do this kind of stuff. I, I compete and I win trophies. Instead, what he did is he ran there, jumped into that freezing water with glass everywhere, dirt everywhere because the bus got to the bottom of it. It took him about 30 seconds to get to the bottom during a dive. He broke the back window of that bus so he can start pulling people out. He would pull people out and drop them, you know, at the shore and his brother would resuscitate him. He did that for many dives. He spent about 30 to 35 seconds for each person. He pulled more than 20 people and only 20 people survived. He got so much glass, dirt in his system that he fainted after 20th dive and he went unconscious. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, he spent 40 days unconscious in the hospital. After this heroic feat, he was never able to compete again. Tw two years later, this news broke out because it was former Soviet Union, so they, they kept a huge control over what gets reported. And they did an interview with him. And they said, tell us about that day. Tell us about what was thinking. What was going on in your mind? Why did you, you pretty much sacrificed your ability to compete. You sacrificed your ability to be a world athlete. He said, what were you thinking? What was going on in your mind? And this is what he said, and I quote, I knew that I could only save so many lives. I was afraid to make a mistake. It was so dark down there, I could barely see anything. One of my dives, I accidentally grabbed a seat instead of a passenger. I could have saved a life instead. That seed still haunts me in my nightmares. Here's a person sacrificing his glory for a greater mission. Here is a person sacrifices, if I can use the biblical terminology, his miracle catch, walking away from that. Never been able to compete again for something that will last for eternity. It's the saving of people. Now he did it physically saving of people. What I want us to know today, it's good to have a miracle catch. It is good to have a breakthrough in your life. But eternity 
will not reward you based on how many fish you caught in your net financially, academically, in your relationships. Eternity will judge you based on one criteria. Have you done what God asked you to do? Have you done that with your finances? Have you done that with your time? Have you done that with your life? Have you done that with your gifts? It's good that you're optimizing them, using them for God's kingdom today. But I want to ask you, are you fulfilling God's purpose? Because sometimes we use our gifts for our own agenda, for our own glory, for our own pleasures and for our own fame and our own prosperity. To build nicer homes, to build bigger platforms and in itself it is not wrong. Paul tells Timothy, tell the rich people they can enjoy things but he said let them store a treasure for eternity. Let them be rich in good works. Let them be rich toward God. I want to challenge our church. While we believe in miracles, we believe in God's prosperity, we believe in God's breakthrough. Ultimately, deepest fulfillment in life, it's not to get a miracle catch. It's to follow the miracle maker where He leads. And if that leads me being crucified on the cross upside down, then that is the greatest win of my life, that Jesus is pleased. And if that leads me to starting a church, if that leads me to starting a life group, if that leads me, whatever that leads me, I am going to follow Jesus. If that leads me being silenced, censored, put in jail because I preach the truth of God in a wicked demonic culture, it is what it is. But I'm going to follow Jesus. This story did not end with Peter having a bigger business, but Peter had a greater life. He who loses his life for my sake will find it, but he who keeps his life will lose it. So when you and I die, I don't want people to say he left home. I want people to say he went home because my home is where Jesus is. My home is where God's will is. May we live for that purpose. Amen.